Hello, my name is Lynn Mayer uh, from the University of Houston and the Houston Geriatric Education Center. And I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about promoting dignity. This work is funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the Department of Health and Human Services. So today what we're going to talk about is dignity and how to treat people with respect when we're caring for them. We're going to define what we mean by dignity. We're going to talk a little bit about how to talk respectfully to people and how to promote dignity in our care we're going to list some of the skills needed in promoting dignity, especially in the case of the dying person. And we're going to discuss what to do and how to communicate with individuals when they don't treat you with the dignity. First, let's talk about what we mean by the term dignity. What does it mean to you? I think it, sometimes it means different things to different people. Does it mean honor? Does it mean respecting the individual? Does it mean avoiding embarrassing situations? Is it an action? What comes to mind when you think of the term dignity? One way to define dignity is as the quality or state of being worthy of respect, esteem, nobility, and honor. It is an inherent nobility and worth. It relates actually to the identity of the person. All humans deserve to be treated with dignity. And the reality is that people feel better when they're treated with dignity and respect. As caregivers, we are legally required to treat people with dignity under the resident's right and client's right laws. And it suits all of us to have that perspective of treating people with dignity and respect when we're caring for a person. Every person has the right to a dignified experience and part of that dignified experience includes self-determination. So what do we mean by self-determination? Self-determination is the right to make your own decisions as much as possible. Of course this is going to vary with context but to the greatest extent possible the people that we care for have the right to make their own decisions. In addition to that, the people that we care for must be allowed to communicate with people both inside and outside of the facility or at home. And the people that we care for have the right to access the services that are provided both inside and outside the facility or at home. This idea of being treated with dignity is applicable no matter what the health status of the individual. Sick and disabled people have the same right to dignity as healthy people. As caregivers, we should treat people with dignity no matter what service we are providing or what job we are doing. Dignity touches all aspects of care and it also includes respecting the individual's culture. So while I'd like to think of treating people with dignity and respect as treating them how I would want to be treated, it's also important to remember that people differ and their cultures differ and it is necessary for us to understand the individual's culture as we're delivering care. So as caregivers we have a core set of values that support this notion of providing care with dignity. These values include the notion of dignity itself and respect as well as self-determination and um, promoting choice as much as possible and finally purposeful living. Now this brings up the concept of patient-centered care. Patient-centered care emphasizes the individuality of the person who needs care and seeks to build community by recognizing and developing each person's capabilities. As caregivers we should base our care 
on each person's needs, habits, and preferences. Recognizing that this is going to differ from individual to individual. So while we have the same set of tasks we might want to accomplish for each person, we have to recognize that each person is going to be different and we have to tailor our care to the individual needs, habits, and preferences of that person. This is the ethical way for us to do our job. In fact, to not consider the individual's needs, preferences, and personal habits would be unethical in delivering care. Let's talk about some ways now that we can convey dignity and respect and how we interact with the people that we care for. Very simply, in how we address them in our conversations. Initially, you want to find out how the person wants to be addressed, what their preferred name is, and how that name should be pronounced. A very easy way to do this is by introducing yourself and then asking the person how they would like to be introduced. For example, I would say, Hello, my name is Lynn Mayer. You can call me Lynn. How would you like me to call you? Or what should I call you? You don't want to use someone's nickname or assume that they want to be addressed by their first name unless they've told you to do so. So you don't want to use someone's nickname or call them by their first name unless they've told you that they want you to do so. You want to avoid using too familiar or disrespectful terms like honey or sweetie that might make the person feel uncomfortable or um, disrespected. A simple thing that you can do to make the person feel respected is to acknowledge them when you walk in the room. People can feel ignored or insignificant or hurt when they're not acknowledged. Even if you're very busy, even if you have a lot to do, you can stop smile, say hello, and then go about your business. You want to keep your tone pleasant and a positive. You can say the same words and convey two very different meanings based on how your tone is. And we all know that sometimes it's not what we say, but how we say it that gets conveyed. So you want to try to, as much as possible to stay cheerful and positive, calm and optimistic. You want to choose your words carefully. Sometimes people are not comfortable talking about things that you've sort of take for granted, especially when it comes to personal care. People might be uncomfortable discussing things like bowel movements, and you want to be sensitive to that in the words that you use. Now, if the patient speaks a language that's different than your own, you want to make sure that you keep your phrases short, simple, and direct but not in a childlike voice. Okay, you don't want to talk down to the individual, but you want to keep your message simple and understandable. It's possible that you might be able to use a few phrases or terms in their language, but you wouldn't want to do that if there are other people in the room who don't speak that language. Of course, you want to avoid using slang, and language that's too familiar, a language that's more appropriate for casual conversations as opposed to a professional relationship. There's no justification for using profanity. And you would never want to scold or belittle the patient to talk to them in a way that would make them feel less. You don't want to talk over the individual. You don't want to talk about them in front of them. You want to include them in the conversation, even if you think they don't understand, even if you don't think they're paying attention. You want to make sure that the person is acknowledged and included in the conversation. In the area of personal care, we have to pay attention to the fact that that's a very personal experience and patients may feel uncomfortable when they're receiving assistance for personal care. These are things that they're used to doing for themselves and it's hard to have somebody else have to help you with those things. One way we can help is by always explaining what it is we're doing before we do it. The caregiver should always take the time to explain exactly what it is they're going to do. You want to ask the individual if they want to use the toilet or the bedpan 
instead of just handing it to them. You want to ask the person if they'd like to use the toilet or use the bedpan and allow the person to make as many personal decisions as they can about their care. Explaining the task and what's going to happen will help reduce the anxiety. So not only is this a legal right that the person has to know what it is that you're going to do, but it helps improve the dynamic of the situation. You want to afford the individual the opportunity to make as many personal decisions as possible and to be part of their care to the extent that you can. So when we're providing this personal care, we want to think about ways that we can reduce the anxiety and the potential embarrassment the person may feel. So some ways that we can do that. One would be to ensure that they have as much physical privacy as possible. Even for people who you think don't know the difference, we want to treat people as if they do. So we want to give them the privacy that they might need. Make sure that the person is properly draped as much as possible and pull the privacy curtains around. Close the doors to assure that there is physical privacy. You want to knock on the door and announce yourself before walking into the room to give the person the opportunity to tell you whether it's okay to come in or not. You always want to respect the privacy of personal conversations. So if the person is on the phone or if they have to take a phone call, if they have to talk to a family member, you want to leave the room, give them that privacy that they need. You want to respect personal and private times as much as possible. Don't interrupt the individual when they're in the bathroom. Try to not interrupt them as they're dressing. Give them the time that they need to accomplish those tasks. Try to be as patient as possible while the person is choosing what it is they want to wear and keep their bodies covered during that process and while you're assisting them with dressing. Bottom line is we want to encourage people to do as much as they can for themselves because that helps in promoting dignity and respect. Okay, so let's talk now for a minute about the dying patient because there are some special considerations we need to make for individuals at this time. Person who takes care of the dying patient has an extra responsibility to consider dignity and respect and in particular respecting that individual's preferences. Certainly the individual has the legal right to privacy and has the legal right to make choices about their care. The individual or the individual's family has the right to refuse treatment and that decision is up to them and it's not up to us to have an opinion about that. It's up to us to be supportive of the decision that they make. We shouldn't be judging the individual for the decisions that they make about refusing treatment. Another consideration is the individual who's dying will have a lot of visitors and it might not be always the most convenient time for people to come visit the patient. We have to accommodate that as much as possible. It helps not only the person who's dying but it helps the family members or the friends and loved ones adjust to that. Being near the patient when they're close to death can help the family members cope with that. And it also can comfort the patient. It doesn't matter if the patient doesn't seem to be aware of their surroundings. It can, they still have the right to visitors and that can still be helpful. They have the right to privacy at all times. We have to respect those wishes and just do our best. Sometimes it might be offering something that's familiar to them, maybe something that they prefer to eat. Our job is to provide as much support as we can in unconditional positive regard for the patient. Remember, our focus is on patient-centered care, so we don't want to talk about our own personal lives in front of the patient. We don't want to talk over the patient to other people in the room. 
Sometimes our job might just be listening and listening with unconditional positive regard. Being around a dying person can bring up a lot of emotions, both sad emotions and sometimes we react to that, those emotions differently. It might cause us to inappropriately giggle or, or feel uncomfortable. You have to try to control that as much as possible. Remember, we're there for the patient. We want to try to keep the patient as comfortable as possible. Keep the bedding clean, keep it dry, keep it wrinkle free, address pain medications in a timely way. You want to respect the privacy of the patient's visitors and family members. It might not be the time that they want to be social. Try to follow their lead. Be prepared to offer comfort run and fetch coffee, make sure the room is a comfortable temperature, try to make the situation as comfortable as possible. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about how sometimes caregivers are not treated with respect and what do we do in that situation? Why is it sometimes that it seems like the patient is impatient or lashes out at the person who's trying to take care of them? Well, it may be, to start off with, maybe that person wasn't always a very nice and patient person to begin with. And certainly, being ill isn't going to make that situation better. Sometimes people are just easily frustrated. The key is to know that it's not personal. It's not really personally directed at you, even though sometimes it feels that way. Often, the person who's sick and is in need of care is fearful or experiencing uncertainty and that anxiety gets passed along to the person who's taking care. That fear of declining health and declining independence can come out as frustration or irritation. Sometimes the people that we take care of might be confused or have difficulty with memory or understanding where they are and they might mistake you for someone that they've known in the past someone who maybe has hurt them in some way. And that may be one of the reasons why they're uncomfortable with you or lashing out. It may be that it's not you, but someone that you remind them of. The person may be feeling panic or fear. And when you approach the individual, that may increase that anxiety. So be cautious about how you approach someone. Never approach them from behind. Try to avoid startling them, but letting them know that you're there and assuring them that you're there to be of help. Sometimes the individual may just have difficulty with hearing because they're older and their hearing has declined and it may make it hard for them to understand what you're saying. They may hear you, but they may not understand the words that you're saying. In this case, shouting isn't necessarily the answer. You want to stop and calmly, as simply as possible, let them know that you're there to be of help and explain what it is you're doing. Patients with Alzheimer's disease or other kinds of dementia, patients recovering from stroke, sometimes don't recognize their need for care. There are always ways to respond professionally and kindly with this type of patient. If the patient is rude or disrespectful, there are several things the caregiver can do. This is not the time to argue with the patient. You're not going to convince them that they're wrong and you're right. You want to take a deep breath, take a step back, take a beat, and calmly try to go about your business. Try to be empathetic, try to maintain a sense of humor, and it may require you to be flexible with the order of your tasks. Try to be as patient and understanding as possible, recognizing that this is not directed at you personally, even though it feels that way. And of course, contact your supervisor if necessary, if the situation has gotten out of control.